of John Soika. He's a Novak member. He's going to be giving a talk uh, entitled Photography for the Night. John Soika is a Department of Defense professional working in the realm of space and intelligence. Mr. Soika is an amateur astronomer who has had the privilege of using his astroph astrophotography skills professionally for his agency. His astrophotography journey started in 2010 with his agency's involvement in NASA's LCROSS mission. He was selected to image the plume on the moon generated by the LCROSS impactor. <laughs> he only got one shot. Mm -hmm. uh, he was selected to image the plume on the moon. Okay. Uh, subsequently, he received the honor of assisting the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum with a successful deep space imaging program for the public and has been a featured speaker at the Almost Heaven Star Parties. Mr. Soika's passion for astronomy started when it's with his father when he was a boy. His father was instrumental in building several observatories and reflector telescopes. Mr. Soika still uses his father's homemade 10-inch reflector telescope to this day. This session is an introductory uh, introduction into the fascinating world of nighttime photography. It will include the basic camera settings and required techniques for imaging targets during the night with camera equipment you already own. The session will cover camera sensor basics so attendees can understand the camera settings and learn how and why to adjust them. By the end of the session, attendees will be able to image objects at night without a flash, please. Uh, uh, <laughs> light painting, the moon, star trails, the Milky Way, and even a deep space object. I've been to many uh, star parties, you know, su supposedly uh, s skilled uh, astrophotographers or whatever, and a flash goes off. Awesome. Uh, so, yes, please don't do that. So, uh, without further ado, John Swiken. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's, it's an honor to be here. So who is an astrophotographer here? Is there somebody who he's even tried it? So folks, this is the truth. This is what my friends think I do, you know, working on equations. This is what my mom thinks I do. This is what some people think I do from society. But this is what it's really like to do astrophotography. You're standing in the field until late at night. And when you're on top of a mountain, it's usually 10 degrees cooler than it is here. And it gets cold, especially. And some of the best things come out a in uh, the winter time. So. Fortunately, you, uh, this is what you do most of the time, so I don't think it's fancy. So um, I, I decided to create this brief uh, like you have a math te textbook in grade school where you open the first page and it's really easy, and then you go to the end of the book and it looks like really hard. And so this is going to start off really simple, and then it's going to get mo more complex. And the reason I'm doing that is so that uh, you can all understand how things are going from the beginning to the end and how, how you get a picture. So. I am going to read this to this one. Uh, a photograph is a photo, uh, excuse me, is an image created by light or photons falling on a light sensitive surface, usually photography film or an electronic medium such as a CCD or a CMOS chip. And I got that uh, from Wikipedia. But the key word here is light and photons. And by the time you leave here, I want you to just think in photons. Every time you look at something, you think in photons. It's, this is going to go someplace. So if you have a camera, you may want to take a picture of this now, but these are the three most in things, um, important things when you're taking uh, imaging at nighttime. You care about the uh, shutter speed. That's the length of time uh, that you expose the sensor to the incoming photons. Uh, the ISO is the sensitivity of that sensor. And I'm actually going to give a, uh, a detailed synopsis of how ISO works so that you understand it and you know how to adjust your camera settings. You probably went through your camera and you don't really totally un understand ISO. Now some of you might, but some of the beginners may not. So if you don't fully understand ISO, the shutter speed and your aperture, this is going to clear all that up for you. And then of course the aperture is the amount of light allowed uh, to a lens, uh, excuse me, through a lens to the sensor controlled by a diaphragm. When you're doing nighttime master photography, you want to open it fully uh, which is your lowest f-stop on your camera. So if you decide, I want to go out and do astrophotography tonight, the first thing you do is you set that f-stop to its lowest value so you can capture light quickly. So when you're thinking of photons, what is light? And I, I can get really fancy here. You know, it's uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation from a certain portion of the spectrum. Uh, it usually refers to visible light uh, uh, that's visible to the human eye. Uh, and uh, it operates at wavelengths for us to see between 400 and 700 nanometers. Uh, that's a, a billionth of a meter. But what is light? So this is a question that I have for the crowd, and I, I want to ask the kids this question. What is light? Is it a ray of light? Is it a frequency? Is it a wave? 
Is it a tiny particle? Who thinks they, they know the answer? Come on, somebody jump in. We got one in the back. You, you think it's a wave? Okay, that's on the table. Who, who, who thinks it might be a particle? Do you, do you think it, it's a particle? Think it's just a particle? No. Okay, so here's the answer. It's all of them. Light travels in little packets called photons. It's also a wave, so, so you weren't incorrect. Uh, and it contains, so a photon contains the properties of all these things you see here, okay? And this is called quantum wave, uh, excuse me, quantum wave particle duality. So when you go back to your science teacher, you could tell them, I learned something about quantum, fi quantum physics today, and they'll be totally amazed. So you're learning something in quantum physics. So the things we care about the most are photons. When you stand outside out there and you hold, hold your hand and you feel the sun, what are you feeling? Where's that heat coming from? Who thinks they have the answer? Somebody in the back? Do you think you know what it is? It's actually the photons. So it's not the firing of the sun. It's, it's not the solar flares. It's, it's, it's none of that. The heat can't travel through a vacuum of space. But the particles that travel and they finally reach us are photons. And the ones that our shirts and things can't and our body can't reflect, they're absorbed into our skin and you feel that heat. So now you can go back to your science teachers and go, oh, I stepped outside today and I felt the photons. So now you know. A lot, a lot of them, but there's millions of them. So when I get you thinking of a camera, I want you to understand that you are not actually taking, when somebody goes, I'm gonna take a picture of a person, I'm gonna take a picture of, of that car. Do you think you're taking a picture of, 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 of a car? Because you're not. What you're taking is, you're taking a picture or you're collecting photons of that person, of that car. So you're getting the photons that are coming off the sun. Did uh, that stop running or is that? Uh, it doesn't matter. So the way the sensor works is you have photons that are coming from the sun. They reflect off the image and they show up on the sensor of your camera. And that's what you're collecting. It's photons. Keep that in mind. And that's, that's probably the core of digital photography. So that's, that's important to remember. That photons, they make up digital photography. Let's go to the next one. Now, a weaker light. So if you have a lamp that's in a room, it's not like the sun. It's not emitting as many photons, is it? right? So it's just not. So what's going to happen is when you have to open your shutter for your camera, it has to stay longer, uh, open longer so that you can collect more, more photons or it's not. There's just not enough photons and then it gets dark. So are there any questions so far? Questions on photons? Okay. So if you are prepared to take pictures tonight, and I guarantee you by the time you walk out of here, you'll be able to take some pictures of stuff tonight with the cameras you have. So you, you, need a point, you uh, can use a point and shoot, a smartphone, a DSLR, which one of you have Nikons and Canons and Pentax, whatever. Or you've, if you have a dedicated space, uh, a dedicated deep space C, uh, CCD camera, but that, re that usually requires a, a telescope. Uh, but, here's, but, but here's your cost. So if you just want to get started quickly and go, I, wanna, I love astrophotography, it's the greatest thing in the world, you can start with, with a point and shoot. I recommend a DSLR because of its flexibility. And you could buy a DSLR from 1998 for, five for $500. You do not have to buy a brand new one. So keep that in mind. Uh, that's that's what, what eBay's for. <laughs> okay, so you may not know it, <coughs> but that's what I'm here to tell you, is this is the electromagnetic spectrum. It, it goes from uh, broadband and radios out to X-rays and cosmic rays and UV and infrared. Now, we've probably all heard of this. We've probably heard of Roy G. Biv, right? That's what we can see, which is this tiny speckle right here, this, th th this real thin line, and, it, and it's blown out right here. But there are some creatures in this world that have cones in their eyes, uh, cones and I'm trying to think what the other things are, rods, that allow them to see a lot more c colors than we do, and they can see out to some of this, so that some of these creatures can actually see some of the UV, the infrared, and perhaps they can even go as far as x-rays. We don't know, we can do experiments on that. But the important thing is because a camera can capture all this, your camera that you bought from Canon or Nikon or whatever has uh, filters in them, they're, they're, they're in inside the housing, that do not allow infrared light to come in or the ultraviolet light. Now, you can get those removed. I tried it myself. I thought I knew it all. I broke my camera. 
I bought another one and I sent that right into Canon and said, please remove the filters for me. So what happens when I take pictures of deep space objects and those objects, if they're producing things in the UV spectrum or the infrared spectrum or something called hydrogen alpha, which you heard about earlier, uh, which you normally cannot capture with the regular camera, you have to get this removed so you can get, get some of that red. So if you plan to ask your photography, uh, I would recommend that you get those removed. Uh, let's go back to this. I think it jumped one too far. Or am I gonna I'm sorry about that. So I'm going to perform a little bit experiment. A, a little experiment. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to need some help. Um, but photon collection and ISO explained. Who thinks they know what ISO is just off the top of their head? Go on. Okay. Okay. So. Correct. And I think a lot of people have trouble trying to visualize that, right? Even though you just told me that, it's kind of hard for me to visualize what you just said. It's it's more photons to uh, to to the sensor. So one of the things I had to learn, and luckily I worked for an, an agency that all these super scientists out of the national labs had sat me down and they said, we're going to explain it to you. So this is how they explained it, and it made it very clear. So we all looked, I don't know, especially kids if they're nosy, looked inside of the housing of the camera and back of the mirror, and you actually see the uh, sensor, and it, and it looks like a CCD, right? Or excuse me, like a CD. Um, but what you're looking at is something called a Bayer matrix. Now, on CCD cameras and monochrome, you don't have this matrix. There's a couple different, but this is the most popular one, and this is how you, you, you get your color. But here's, this is what I think is going to help everybody with their ISO settings. So if I were to, uh, I wonder if I should start with my experiment first. Yeah, we'll, d we'll just wait. Um, if I were to open the shutter and shut it right away, let's just say I collect three, th three photons and an ISO of 100. That's the lowest setting. And that's saying, do not do anything with my data. Use the data as is. Um, but let's just say that I up the ISO to 200. So what it does, your camera will take the, uh, if it th it'll take the setting of 200 divided by a number, excuse me, divided by 100 times the number of photon that you've collected, and in this case, it's doubled. So two times three is going to give you six photons in your camera. So you just made it that much brighter. Okay, it goes up the chain that if you set your ISO setting to 400, uh, you know, then it ends up being four times three, and you get 12 photons. So that's called gain. That's your ISO's gain. So you can just take a quick picture and get a little bit of light, but if you have the ISO really, really high, you'll get a nice bright picture, but you don't always want to do that. Uh, a couple of the reasons I'll go into later, but quickly, uh, if you set the ISO too high, you lose your dynamic range, which means you lose a lot of color. So if you take a picture of something at a high ISO, and it's got like pink and reds and oranges, but your ISO is really high, you'll just kind of see pink. You won't see the, the detailed colors, but if you took it at a lower ISO setting with a higher, sh with a lower shutter speed to collect more photons, you're going to see those subtle pinks and reds and oranges. So that's that's one of the reasons you that you do that. Um, see, I go here. So you know what? I think it's just time to do an experiment. Uh, who who wants to help me with it? You want to help me? Yeah, come on up. So just if you stand over here, I'll, I'll start explaining something. So you can actually keep your ISO setting. Is, is, is this still good? Just. So if you up the ISO setting too high, you can collect so many photons that they overflow. Okay, And as you collect more and more photons, your picture is getting brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And have you ever taken a picture of something and it's just washed out? It's just totally white or it's near white and you see some structure? That's because you put so many photons. So these are actually uh, wells. They're perceived as wells, but they count the number of photons that hit it. But, vi but visually, they are wells. So you can overflow them. And once they begin to overflow, your picture is going to come out white. So what you want to do is, this is going to be an experiment, and he's going to help me with it. And let's just see how good he is. N normally, when you're filling the wells with photons, you want to do about one third of that cup. Okay, and there's a reason that I'm going to show you later why you want to do that. But that's also when you get your optimal picture. That is when your picture has the right amount of photons collected. Because sometimes I'll, you'll ask yourself, 
did I expose correctly? Was it the right amount of time? Could I have get gathered more data? You just never really know, unless you get into this two, this two thirds is the, is the sweet zone. So what I'm gonna do is, this is gonna be our photons. This is gonna be our, our sun. You are gonna work the shutter, okay? Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pour some photons into here. And you need to open and close that shutter uh, so that it lands, so it lands right at that red line. Okay, you want to see how good you are? All right. So now I'm going to start pouring, and then when that happens, I want to see if you can try to time it. So close it. That's closed shutter. Okay. So here I go. One, two, three. Open it. Go. Okay. So that. So that that shutter speed was what about a second and, and a half. Okay, so maybe for this dark environment, it took a second and a half. Now, I if the sun was brighter, I'm actually going to toss this now. This is it, okay? Now I'm going to make this a little bit harder. I, I want you to hold it back. Now let's just say it's midday and the photons are flowing. There's a lot of light. So let's so shut it again. And here I go. Are, are you ready? Go. Uh, let's, let's go try it again. Do you want to hold it with one hand? Okay, so here I go. Are you ready? Go. Dude, you got skill. So th that was probably uh, half a second. So when you work your camera, that's what happens. It collects photons, and there's millions of them that hit that sensor. And, and that's why your shutter speeds are sometimes 1 125th, 180. But when you shoot at the night, sometimes it's into the seconds. So th thank you very much. Let's have a hand for you are Dave. Dave, thank you very much. All right. So photon collection, makes sense? Any questions on that? I think that's pretty clear, at least in my mind's eye. So, do planets make their own light? Who, who thinks they do? You think planets make their own light? Yep. Okay. So, man, you, you've got guts for raising your hand. So, uh, planets need reflected light just like a person does. So they need the sun to reflect light. So like the moon, so if we take a picture of Jupiter, do you know that the photons reflected off of Jupiter, I think it's four and a half minutes, something like that? Is it much longer, 12, something like that? Sun's, you can do the math, but from the sun it's like six minutes? 8.3, so then you're thinking probably, I don't know, 12 minutes, something like that. So. The way we image the moon and the planets is not direct light. We're looking at reflected light, okay? And when I was growing up as a kid, I used to think they, m they made their own light, but they don't. So, space objects that emit their own photons. The sun and stars, we already know that, okay? You, you have galaxies and you have nebulae, which is uh, multiple nebula. But... When you think about it and you look at a galaxy, what's a galaxy made of? Stars. So once again, stars are like your light source for everything. When a nebula is emitting light, why is that? Go on. So that's one. So you know what? I didn't even think of that, but, but that's true, okay? It either is reflecting off the stars or there's this nearby star that uh, is exciting the atoms of the gases that are nearby. And then they actually make their own light as a result of that. So those you could directly, so tonight if you wanted to, I mean, obviously you can do the sun, galaxy, stars, you can do that right now. <clears throat> so if you wanna get started tonight, and like I wanna go out there, Mr. Soika has impressed me so much, I'm just gonna go out there and do it. Um, your basic, or your, your basic camera system that's using uh, a lens is any DSLR, any point and shoot camera, okay? Any smartphone with adjustable ISO and shutter speed. So this is what I do know, is that there are some apps on your phone that mm, you, can, you can download that turns your m smartphone into more like a DSLR. You can adjust you know, shutter speeds and things like that. I'm not sure, I haven't used that yet, but I do know you can do it. And as long as you can modify those things, you're totally golden. Uh, lens, any lens from 55 to 300. I saw Mr. Ward after me or before me uh, mention uh, lenses that were 500 to 3,000. I don't think what he told you was some of those lenses are 1,000 to $10,000, right? Some of those? I mean, there's cheaper ones, but when you really want to take good pictures, so there's a way around that. But you do the best you can with the money you have. 
And then mount, you can use any tripod to get started, just, just like you see right here. So that's going to come in handy later. Uh, let's just say, you know what, I want to get a uh, telescope, and uh, I want to start to do it with that. Uh, if you're going to start, start with a reflector that's six inches or greater. You could go less, uh, but believe me, there's something called aperture fever, and when you bought a four inch, you realize you should have bought a six, and you buy a six, you realize you should have bought an eight or a 10 inch. So my recommendation is get the biggest one that you can afford. Uh, refractor, you at least want to start with a three inch uh, or greater. Uh, there's something called an APO style that's with three lenses and it makes sharp, crisp pictures. So if you're going to invest the money, make sure you ask the guy at the sales store, is this an APO? Uh, mount, highly recommend an equatorial mount, but you can begin with an alt azimuth or a Dobsonian. Uh, how many know what those are off the top of their head? They're just basic mounts. Most of you probably already know that. Uh, camera, any planetary camera, which is basically a, a webcam, uh, DSLR, which you'll need a, a T adapter, which I'll go into shortly, and then or a dedicated deep space CCD Im imaging camera, and that's one of those real expensive ones. Let's go to the next one. So, if you have a camera, you may want to take a picture of this now for those that are just starting out. Um, when you go out into the field, if you want to take something, a picture in the inner city, if you want to take a picture of stars, if you want to take a picture of your house at nighttime, start with these settings. Now, somebody might argue that that ISO was really low, but this is, excuse me, high, but this is just to start. So if you realize I'm going to go out at night to take some pictures without a flash, set your camera to manual or bulb, ISO to 1600, f-stop to its lowest number, white balance auto, auto rotate off, Auto focus off and you can see the rest. You definitely want raw because with any other format like JPEG, you like lose data. So trust me, you want raw format. Uh, flash off, because we're not using flash. Auto focus, you want to turn off. Now there's some cameras that are becoming sensitive enough to focus on nighttime objects, uh, but usually not. So you, need, you usually need to turn off the auto focus and then you have to manually focus with your uh, lens, okay? Mirror flip, uh, you want to turn the flip off. H how many know the reason why? Arlen, it's too easy for you. Vibration. You, you, you got it, vibration. So if you're going to open your uh, shutter for a second, and sometimes it's for as long as five minutes to two hours, that's when you get into really advanced stuff. But when you hit, when you use your finger to take your picture, click, it's vibrating a little bit now. And the shutter open, and I'm taking a picture of something that's, 30 million miles away, and one little bit of movement makes that thing look like it's 8 million miles, like, like moving all, all over the place. So you don't want to use your hand. You can use a timer, and what I recommend you do is you, you if you turn the mirror flip function on, you, you hit the, the picture taking button, and it flips, and you hear it. Then you press it again on the camera, and then It'll take a picture in 10 seconds if you set that, the timer for 10 seconds. And this way, nobody's touching it, and it just takes the picture. And this way, you get those crisp pictures, but when th and there's no blur in the picture. Long exposure noise reduction. Uh, that is a camera. That is a function on most cameras. I've seen them on Nikons. I've seen them on Canons. I'm not really sure about Pentex and Olympus. But what that does is, is it removes the noise from your picture. So when you're dealing in with higher ISOs, you're taking a lot of noise. Who's taking a picture at night of something and there's all these pixels and it doesn't look as good as the ones that you see on the internet? Okay? It's, it's kind of pixelated, right? So if you have a camera, you turn noise reduction on and, and what happens is this. If you take a picture of something for one minute, okay, and it opens the shutter and it images for one minute, the shutter will close, but then you see the light come back on the camera and it's taking another picture for one minute again, of just the darkness. And what it's doing is it's capturing all the junk in a one minute picture. Then it goes back, it takes your light frame, takes that dark frame you just took, and it subtracts the noise from your main picture and it gives you a good clean picture. Got that? So if you get a chance, turn that on. There's reasons in astrophotography, you don't want to turn it on if you're taking pictures for five, 10 minutes or a couple hours, just because you don't want to wait. A, if it's a one hour picture, you don't want to wait two hours for it to process. So. There's ways to work through that, but that's advanced stuff. Uh, photography for the night. So let's get started. You have something right now, and you've seen pictures of people who've taken these pictures of buildings at night. Like, how do they do that? Okay, it's it's not rocket science, folks. But we'll get to that. Uh, any digital camera, 
any tripod or mount, set your ISO to 1600. Set the exposure time or the shutter speed to about one second, and that's what I did for this target. Point and focus on the target. Uh, like I said, you may need to manually focus because there may not be enough light. Uh, use a timer or an intervalometer, which I'll get to in the future. I'll explain what that is. But that's, that's actually the cord you had that hooks into your camera, so you don't have to touch it, but you just use the button that's remote. Recommend you get that if you can do any time astrophotography or nighttime photography because you don't want to touch your camera once you set it up. Really important. Don't move the camera. And then, um, uh, point and shoot. Just I actually removed the wrong thing. Take your shot and then make corrections by adjusting the ISO or the exposure time. So, this shot looks great, okay? And you say, you got this the first time? Well, no. So, if I had my ISO set to 800 for exposure of one minute, it would have been too dark because I didn't, I didn't collect enough photons. And where, where are the photons c coming from this time? Just out of curiosity, it's nighttime. Where, where are the photons coming from? Light bulbs, the ambient light, lights in the street, car lights, these lights that are, are, are over here, okay? So you can use ambient light or the lights that are in the dome itself that when they reach your camera, you just start, you start to record them. And then here is an ISO of, of 3200 at one second. It is too high. Um, but I did want to... So you, here's a question for the crowd. If I did want to take a, a shot at 800 so that it's a little bit more sharp with more color, I was talking about the uh, dynamic range so I get more good color, how long should I expose for? One second, two seconds, five, ten? Who's got an idea? Two seconds. For about, for about two seconds, and then you, you give that a shot. You usually don't, you don't get it the first time, but you get it by the second or, th or, th or third. So don't expect to take your first shot to be perfect. But those are things you could do, and in fact, I recommend that. If you can do a lower ISO, do it. And you'll find that you will be balancing between the ISO and the exposure time. Remember I said there's three things you care about, the aperture, the ISO, and the exposure time, which is the shutter speed. What if you take a picture uh, for one or two seconds with traffic moving? So, so what do you think is going to happen? You know, the object that was standing still is still there, but now you're taking those cool pictures that you see on the Internet of stuff that's moving, okay? If, if you've ever wondered how that's done. Increased exposure time to those photons, well, because these cars are moving, right? Do we, do we got that? All right. Accessories, I was talking about the remote switch and the timer. Uh, you definitely want to use these. This is for advanced astrophotography, but if you're going to get out there tonight or something, uh, I actually had another mount that was pretty cheap that I can loan somebody. But if you can, you want to take pictures. You know what? You also don't have to use a tripod. If you can angle a book or a computer and just point your camera at the stars, that's good enough. You don't need a tripod, okay? So you can finagle something. Yeah. Use, use whatever you got to use. Um, condition. So this is ideal. This is definitely what we want. Clear, cool, dark, dry, stable atmosphere. Well, currently we're not experiencing all this. It's actually, it's a little bit uh, overcast, not too bad. Definitely not cool. Uh, uh, it's not dark yet, but pretty soon it will be. It's not dry. It's a little humid. And the atmosphere, we don't, we don't really know yet if it's really stable, but we will see. But when you do, these are things you definitely do not want. You definitely do not want it to be overcast. And why is that? Do you want my prize student? Yeah, so photons aren't going to get through to your camera. If you can't visually see Jupiter or a star, there's no photons that are coming to your camera. So if your eyes can't see it or you can't see it with a pair of binoculars, you're not going to get inside your telescope or camera. Uh, wind. Uh, Definitely do not, you do not want wind when you're doing long exposure astrophotography. Even a second or two is a lot, because if it's really windy, it's going to be rocking your tripod. You don't want the moon unless you're shooting the moon. Uh, because the ambient light is reflecting, excuse me, it is reflecting sunlight back to you, and that's ambient light. And as you're trying to take pictures of stars, that moonlight is hitting your sensor and it's washing out, you know, the Milky Way and stars in, 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 uh, in a galaxy. So most imaging is done for deep space objects when there's no moon, which is what, what's called the new moon. So when there's a new moon, look on your calendar and go, it's going to be dark tonight because there's no moon. That's when you want to go out. You don't want to be near cities because of sky glow. You probably can figure out that, excuse me, you can figure out by now uh, that the sky glow is going to reflect off the clouds and go back to your sensor. So that's why we come out here to the, um, 
to the uh, state parks, which are well away from the city, and it's just to get it as dark as it, as it can be. Heat, you can actually capture heat waves. I've had distortions in my equipment when it was just too hot. I used I used to run these, these heaters on my uh, telescope, and then all of a sudden they were very distorted because I, I got all these heat waves that were in front. I'll never make that mistake again. Humidity, um, it's going to become clear in the next picture why humidity is your enemy, uh, but one of the top reasons is dew can form on your equipment. And you get like, I mean, have you ever come outside really early in the morning and the grass has water on it or it's on your car on the windshield? Well, what do you think is happening to your telescope at 2 in the morning? Uh, as it gets coated with dew, and you have to be out there wi wiping it, or there's things called dew heaters, uh, but you have to pay attention to that. I think that's pretty clear. So, a couple, this is, so, <laughs> if you can take a picture of a target, you want to take a, if optimally, you want it right overhead. Now, if the moon's there, if a galaxy is there, if it's someplace here, it, it's great, uh, because you're cutting through less Ear, ear masses. If anything is below 30, so if you go like this and the object's below, you don't want to take that picture. The main reason, well, first, you can, you can, it's really clear. You're cutting through more ear masses. So this object that, in this case, it's Saturn, it's straight up. And you see you're only cutting through one atmosphere. So you're cutting through one atmosphere of humidity, rain droplets, cloud cover, you know, if, if, if it's thin, particulates, pollution, and all that kind of stuff. You're only cutting through one atmosphere, but here you're cutting like to like more than four atmospheres thick of junk. And that's why you want to try to get a picture of something straight up or if you can. So also, if you cut through too much of the atmosphere, your object will, um, it's called atmospheric diffraction. You'll look at your, your object, and if you look closely enough, you'll see that you don't have an entire Saturn. It's broken into three smaller Saturns stacked on top of one another. You see a red one, a green one, and a blue one. So you don't want to go through because that's atmospheric lensing. It'll start to warp and bend the light. Right? That's pretty clear, right? Yeah. Uh, real quick with this. So do you remember when he was trying to fill that cup one third, of, uh, one third of the way? So on the back of your camera, especially your DSLR camera, you're like, what is this, this thing here? What's this histogram? What, what good is this to me? What's the purpose of this? It, it shows me some data, but well, guess what? Here is your one-third of the cup. So when you take a picture, okay, and it's over, and this histogram of light that was captured is over here. Is, is, is that overexposed? Somebody jump in? Yeah, I, I got some, some head shaking here, yes. If it's over here, is that, is that underexposed? All right. So something really, really quick. This is a little math question for the kids. If my, if, if this histogram was over here, if, if, it was, if it was right over here, and I took a picture of ISO 800 for one second, and I realized it was over here, it's too small, I need to move it here, what should I do? Guys, do I increase ISO? Do I increase... Correct. You want to increase so that you eventually begin to uh, shift this towards the right. And that's when you know you're taking a correct picture and how it's perfectly exposed. Real quickly, just want to jump in here. I mean, here, here's some pros and cons for the short exposures and the high SO settings. But remember I was talking about it being very pixelated, okay, versus nice and smooth. So if you can, try to shoot at the lower ISO, but bring in more photons I if you can through a longer exposure. Uh, something that you could do tonight. So this place can show the Milky Way, and I'm hoping that tonight's one of those nights. But if you can, you can use, you can use any mount, like you see here. You use any camera. The, the best lens is between uh, uh, f-stops between 1.5 to f3 with uh, 15 to 30 uh, millimeter focal length. Set your ISO to 1600 to 3200. That's kind of high, but I just want, I want you to get something. Uh, Mr. Ward has, was talking about the 500 rule. That's where you take the focal length, length of your telescope uh, excuse, and you, 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 you divide that into 500 and that gives you the amount of time that you can image for without showing star trails or, or, or movement. Because if you were exposed for too long, just like you saw the, the, the uh, traffic lights uh, moving, you'll eventually start to see stars move, okay? 
So what you want to do is you want to follow this rule so that you get the correct time of, of, of exposure. And then recommend to use a, re a remote switch to prevent the vibration. Point it at the Milky Way. Focus on infinity. Uh, let me just pop this out. So some of you have probably wondered, what's this little figure eight on, on my camera? I have never used that before. Okay, when you deal with something really far away like the Milky Way and stars and galaxies, you move it to, 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 to infinity. And that's how you, you capture that light. Um, sometimes it's not perfect, but for these shots for the Milky Way, it is, it, it's perfect enough. Um, and then you focus on infinity, like I just said, I image for the computer exposure time, and then post process in any photography application. Yeah. I set that down. I start whipping through these. If you want to get, if you want to take one of these cool pictures, this was taken at almost having star party a few years ago. Um, you use any amount again. This time again, you just point it at the North Star. We all know where the North Star is, or you can find somebody to show you where it is. Okay, set it between your ISO between 400 and 800. Point it at Polaris. Again, focus on infinity to that little figure eight symbol. Okay, uh, optional, so, so you don't have to touch it. Uh, you want to take pictures for um, five minutes, excuse me, up to five minutes each for about two hours. So you're, you're exposing... So you open the shutter and you have a timer for, for five minutes and you just, wow, the thing's imaging for five minutes. You know, and, you, and in that time, you might capture planes going through, people walking by, hopefully not. But when you start to, to do that, uh, those stars will, will start to move. Okay, then you, you, then you, if you want to take breaks in between, you don't want to take more than five seconds. Because if you do, you're going to have gaps inside your, your uh, star trails. Uh, again, don't move the camera. And then there's something called Photoshop Star Trails and uh, Action. And there's a regular program called Star Trails that lets you combine all the pictures you took over the, you know, the two hours worth of individual pictures and you combine them into one thing that looks like this. Any questions? You guys too hot? All right. Uh, really quick, let's just say uh, you have uh, reached a point where you... Uh, want to step up a little bit. Got this, got my camera. So there's a couple ways that you can do this, but there's something called a, it's right here, a T-ring and a, and a T-adapter. So this is your T-ring, and they make these for Canon, they make them for Nikon. So this, again, this is your, your T-adapter, they make this for Nikon, Olympic, they, they're, they're brand specific. And then uh, you buy the uh, T-adapter, which will go into your telescope. So you just snap this on, so you pop off your lens, and then what, what you then do is you just uh, walk over to your telescope. You pop out the diagonal. Let's get this out of the way. And there's really no magic to this. You just get your DSLR camera. And so when people bring out their telephoto uh, lenses, you say, this one's mine. Okay? <laughs> and so when they're trying to focus like this, you're like, well, watch this. Okay? So... You won't be able to autofocus for sure. You're going to have to manually focus. And then there's something called the Batnov mask, which I'll show you in a few seconds. But then you just use this to focus, and you just look in the back, and you just, you just, you just focus that way. Okay. This is more advanced. I'm not going to get into this. This is sticking stuff that's in between and blow-up pictures and things like that, but I, we don't need to talk about that now. But tonight, may maybe you can ask one of the astronomers to plug your, tele to your camera into their telescope and have them shoot you a picture. So the Batnov mask, I, I got it in, in, in a drawer, but you might be wondering, this is not a lens that shows me where infinity is. How do I take a picture of something like a galaxy that's at infinity? I don't know where infinity is. There, there's no marking on here. So what you do is, there's a mask that hangs on the front right here. Right here, you just put it on there, and it, and it looks like this. And as you work the focus, or I should probably show this again, as you go in and out, in and out, if you start going too far out, this line will start to move to the right, okay? If you go back the other way, it starts going this way, okay? But when you get a perfect X, you are, you are focused and infinity, you lock everything down, you take off your Batonoff mask, very important, forget to take off that mask, because many of astro imagers because there's giggles, because they know. They, they leave that sucker on there, they image something for hours, and then they get home and they go, why aren't, are all my stars X's? And they go, oh my God, I left my Batonov mask on. So remove it when you're done. Um, ripping through here. I promised, uh, let, let's take a shot of the moon. Uh, DSLR camera is recommended. I think Mr. Ward was actually showing 
if you just have a point and shoot, it's kind of hard. They look, they, look, they look really tiny. This is when you start to want to use a telescope, just like you see there. Uh, if you do y you use a lens, you want something that's bigger, between 100 to 300, or bigger if you can afford it, uh, or a telescope in this case. You can impress your friends. A any mount or tripod, set the ISO 1 to 200. W why so low? Why is my ISO so low? Yeah, that, that moon is bright. And I guarantee you, if you up that to 3200, it'd be a, a white circle. And you're like, well, where's all the craters? So you want to tone it down. A good s so I went back to my pictures at home with a Canon camera, and I looked up all of the metadata. And my a average pictures were usually at 1 to 1 25th of a second shutter speed. So very important just to start. Set your ISO to 200. When you look at the moon, you just look at where that line is and see if you need to shift it left or right. Remember in, in that histogram? And then you know that, that that's a good, uh, a good uh, um, uh, exposure time. Point at the moon, focus manually, optional again, int the interval armor so you don't have to touch it. Take the shot and then adjust the ISO as needed. So this is getting towards the end of my brief, uh, but this might really excite you. How many people recognize the Orion constellation? Yeah? Most of you? Okay, good. And if you don't, you just ask one of the people here to show it to me. I don't think it's up yet. I mean, I, I, has it already set? Is it too late? Okay, so there are other constellations. Speak to the astronomers here and say, show me a nebula, okay? But if you're sitting at home one day and you go, there's Orion? This guy at the astronomy day was telling me that I could take a picture of something great. So... Yeah, but you could start in fall to try to squeeze it in there, right? So fall through, through early spring. Uh, but so, so, so here he is. That, that's him. And here's his legs. And then right here, right about in the middle, there looks like something like a star or like, like three stars. Go, go to this one that's right in the middle. You know, so focus at infinity, like, like I said here. You know, focus on infinity or the figure eight or your telescope. Uh, take a 30-second 30 30 exposure at the 1600 ISO. Don't move the camera. Uh, and here's what you're going to get for your 30 sec and you will capture something. So that's what it looks like. That was my first picture ever. That was, I was so proud I made my friends nuts, kept showing them this stupid picture. And you know what? I'm looking at this now and there's all this thing called coma, vignetting in the corners. It's like stretching the stars. But you know what? I was so impressed by it that I, I haven't looked back. So let's see. After seven years of doing this, okay. Those are the kinds of pictures that I, I've been taking now, and it's very addictive. Once you get into astrophotography, you're like, what's the next thing that I can target? And so here's all the, the advanced settings, which I offer another lecture called Astrophotography for the Beginner, Intermediate, Advanced. So if you want to come to one of those speeches, I'll, I'll tell you how we do all this. But for now, uh, that's what we can do. Any questions? Are you all going to go out and take pictures tonight? All right, I got thumbs up for the camera. No one is screaming over there. All right, if there's no questions, then we'll take a break, and I guess we'll get ready for the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you.